All right. This is one of the things with the Christian responsibility, the theology of the world, each one to his own beliefs. You have to respect each one's belief system. The world says everyone is entitled to his own opinion, which is true. Each one is to his own set of beliefs. But then it goes on. It also maintains that one must not attempt to disturb the status quo of an individual's belief system, for that is what is true for them. Relativism. It is none of anyone else's business and it is morally wrong to attempt to persuade people to believe what one believes. This theology is often maintained by making the statement, that's what you believe, as if to say that whatever anyone says, he will refu not refute the truth of the belief system of another and every, everyone's belief system is true for them. But truth is not uh, established by what one believes, it, truth is established by what the evidence is that proves it's true or not. In any case, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So an objector to the Christian viewpoint who upholds each to his own theology will often ask a leading question or make a leading statement in order to check out another's conformity with his own personal worldview especially the Christians. <clears throat> By this act, those who espouse each to his own violates his own theology, for he is expressing his beliefs to another as if to say that these are true for everyone. Isn't a person at least entitled to answer such a challenge from his own system of beliefs? Not so the Christian. That same individual often becomes offended at the faithful Christian's answer. You're not supposed to tell me about your belief system. Well, you just told me yours and creates an argument. And they also say you're not allowed to argue, but they'll argue. He'll, he will often take exception to the believer's answer and launch, launch a verbal attack on the believer's character. Thus the stance that one takes of each to his own theology becomes hypocritical because he won't let the Christian have his own beliefs. Faithful believers often have their behavior closely scrutinized by each to his owners such as that unbelievers and weak, resentful Christians point out the smallest of shortcomings in the believer's life. All the more you try to hone that down and be more godly, but sometimes godly behavior is misunderstood as ungodliness. Often these shortcomings are outright fabrications. Believers who receive persecution by others are made responsible for their own persecution. Because of the negative re reactions of those who hear the believer's testimony, those who listen in on the conversation, and even those who ask the question, the believer is determined to be deserving of such persecution, and the persecutors are thereby not only exonerated from guilt, but justified by the world in their actions. But not so with God. There is no justice in this world when you're testifying for Christ, and they're against it. The subject of divine viewpoint from Scripture is often disallowed from discussion within the workplace because of those who object to hearing it. Yet subjects which are obscene, usually of a vile sexual nature, taking the Lord's name in vain, swear words, and so on, are constantly, consistently permitted. Non-Christians can voice their opinion about anything, but a Christian cannot. If he does, he is often cited for being argumentative. In actuality, is almost always the other party who brings up an anti-Christian subject and then objects at the Christian answers. His objection is usually an accusation that the believer is being argumentative when he is the, the one who's brought up the controversial subject. So this leads to a corollary of each to his own beliefs theology, which is, it is wrong to argue. <clears throat> you just like to argue, they say. The accusation usually comes at the time when an individual is making a really good defense for his point of view, and then the personal attack begins. You're not supposed to argue anyway, as if this statement wins the day for the accuser who's brought up the subject in the first place. This attack then begs the question, if you hold to each to his own theology and the premise that one should not argue, then why are you imposing your beliefs on someone else yourself? And then why do you initiate the argument? Incidentally, God commands the believer to provide a good defense and a good argument for what is true in God's word. So being argumentative is not always wrong. But sanctify Christ, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, as Christ is Lord in your hearts, having always being ready to make a defense, that's an argument, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, with gentleness and reverence. Jude 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you 
about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend, which means argue, for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Philippians 1.27 Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whatever, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending, arguing as one man for the faith of the gospel. One might ask the question given the opportunity to relay the truth about going to heaven instead of hell, or the truth about earning rewards instead of dire consequences in heaven and on earth, is it not the duty of an individual to pass on this information so that others can benefit if they so choose? So when a window of opportunity opens for a believer, through what he responds, then he's obligated by which by God to give a divine viewpoint answer. T.A. McMahon states in the, the Berean Call, Brother, I'm not interested in any of your divisive doctrinal talk, someone says to him. All I care about is knowing that a person loves Jesus. If someone tells me that no matter what church he goes to, he's my brother in Christ. It's not biblically true. It didn't seem like the right time or place, Mr. McMahon says, to go and get into an argument with this individual. Nevertheless, I felt compelled, he says, at least to get a question in before the conversation ended. When you talk about someone who tells you he loves Jesus, do you ever ask that person, Jesus who? After quick thought, the elderly gentleman let me know that he would never ask such a question. It wouldn't be loving. When I, answer, when I visit friends in Pennsylvania, there is a man when I make it a point to see. He is a joy to be with, one of the friendliest men I know. Though a committed Muslim, he regards himself as an ecumenist. He's proud of the fact that he shares some of the beliefs of both Jews and Christians. Occasionally he attends a Presbyterian church with my friends and enjoys, and truly enjoys the experience in their fellowship. Once in a restaurant, he was expressing to me and our Christian friends his love for Jesus. He ended his proclamation with these words, If I could tear away my flesh so that all of you could see deep into my heart, you would know how much I love Jesus. The emotions that filled his every word were stunning. It's uncommon to hear such a devout declaration, even in Christian circles. Getting back to my boys and very pie, I felt good about my friend's expression of love when a nagging thought hit me. Jesus who? A brief mental skirmish took place over whether or not to ask such a question. My words, however, came out before my mind had settled the issue. Tell me about the Jesus you love, I asked. My Muslim friend didn't hesitate. He's the same one you love. Before I got doctoral with my friend, I thought I should try to show him why it was important to make sure we were talking about the same Jesus. I used his neighbor, who was a great friend to both of us, as an example. He and I really loved the guy. After agreeing on our mutual feelings, I began to give a description of our common friend's physical attributes. He's five foot six, completely bald, weighs 320 pounds, wears a ring on his left nostril. Actually, I didn't get quite that far. He's kind of making up a story before objections were made. Wait a minute. He's easily over six foot four. I wish I had all his hair, and he's the thinnest man I know. My friend asked, added that it was obvious that we weren't talking about the same person. Does it matter, I asked. He gave me an incredulous look. Of course it does. I don't have a neighbor fitting your description. You may know someone else like that, but it's not my good friend and neighbor. I pointed out that I truly believe the description, if I truly believe the description I'd just given, then we couldn't possibly be friends with the same person. And he agreed. <clears throat> and what he followed was my description of the Jesus I knew. He said, he was crucified and died on the cross for my sins. Did the Jesus you know do that? No, he said. Allah took him to heaven before the crucifixion. Judas died on the cross. <clears throat> Jesus, as I know, is God himself who became a man. Is that your Jesus, Mr. McMahon said. He shook his head. No, Allah is alone is God. Jesus was a great prophet, but just a man. The discussion went on to many other characteristics the Bible describes to Jesus. In almost every case, <clears throat> my Muslim friend had a different perspective. Though he remained convinced that he held the correct view, the fact that our cont contradictory convictions couldn't be reconciled seemed to dampen his zeal for proclaiming his love for Jesus. Some may see my questions questioning as unloving, 
as proof of the division, divisiveness of arguing over doctrines. I see it as trying to clear the way for my friend to have a genuine relationship with the only true Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Not someone he or other men have wittingly or unwittingly imagined or devised. Quite simply, doctrines are teachings. They're either true or false. A true doctrine cannot be divisive in a harmful way. That characteristic applies only to false teachings. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Romans 16, 17 and Romans 2, 8 to 9. Jesus, who is the truth, can only be known in truth and by those who seek the truth. So Christ himself caused division, division between truth and error. So you have to be on the side of truth. If you get uh, offended by that, but at least they're giving you, you, somebody's giving you the truth. Jesus, who is a pivotal question for every believer in Christ? We should first of all ask it of ourselves, testing our own beliefs about Jesus. Misunderstandings about him inevitably become obstructions in our relationship with him. The question also may be vital in our fellowshipping with those who claim to be Christians. <coughs> On a brief airline flight, recently a friend of mine was concerned enough to ask the person next to him some crucial questions about his relationship with Jesus. Although the young man professed to have, a, have been a Christian for four years or so and participated in a Christian fellowship for professional athletes, <clears throat> he didn't really know Jesus, nor did he understand the gospel of salvation. My friend led him to the Lord before the plane landed. All too often, phrases similar to we stand together with anyone who names the name of Christ are emotionally charged coverings for ecumenical agendas, nothing based on the truth. The fear of destroying unity plays, plagues those who take seriously such unbiblical propaganda, even to the point of discouraging any vestige of interest in contending for the faith. Astonishingly, Christian unity now includes co-laboring for the moral good of society with cults that name the name of Jesus. The cults teaching about Jesus included <clears throat> every unscriptural idea imaginable. <clears throat> the, Je the Jesus of the Latter-day Saints for example, could be further removed, couldn't be further f removed from the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus invented by Joseph Smith, after whom he named his church, is the first spirit child of Elohim, just as all humans, angels and demons, are spirit children of Elohim. This Mormon Jesus became flesh through physical intercourse with Elohim, God the Father, who has a physical body, and the Virgin Mary. Their Jesus is the half-brother of Lucifer, who came to earth to become a god, his sacrificial death gives immortality to every creature, including animals, at the resurrection. However, whether an individual creature spends eternity in hell or in one of the three heavens is totally up to his or her performance. That's not the biblical Christian and the Jesus. The Jesus Christ of the mind science cults, Christian science, religion science, religious science, unity of school, Christianity, is no different from any other human being. Christ is the spiritual idea of God and not a person. Jesus neither suffered nor died for mankind's sins because sin didn't exist. It doesn't exist. Rather, he helped humanity to cease from believing that sin and death have any reality. That is salvation in the so-called Christian science. <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses also loved Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. Before their Jesus was born on earth, he was the Michael the Archangel. He is a God, but not Jehovah God. When their Jesus became a man, he ceased to be a God. There was no physical resurrection of the J.W. Jesus. Jehovah raised his spirit body, hid his physical remains, and now once again Jesus exists as an angel called Michael. <clears throat> the Bible promises that when a believer in our Lord Jesus and late Savior dies, he and, our, and she immediately goes to be with Jesus. With their Jesus, however, only 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses have that privilege, not, but not at death, for they are annihilated when they die. That is, they spend an indefinite period in an inactive and unconscious state, in effect ceasing to exist. My fellowship of love with the biblical Jesus, however, is unbroken and everlasting. And finally, Roman Catholics love Jesus. I did for 20 years of my life, but he was very different from the Jesus I know and love. Sometimes he was still a babe in arms or a young boy, overshadowed and protected by his mother. When I wanted his help, I made sure I prayed to his mother at first. The Jesus to whom I pray now hasn't been a baby for almost 2,000 years. More on this next time.